Most people are familiar with the mint marks on U.S. coins, blank or P for the Philadelphia Mint, D for the Denver Mint. Less commonly, you see the S for the San Francisco Mint, and we still operate a mint at West Point, which uses the mint mark W. But fewer people are familiar with the fact that, for example, the Denver Mint was not the first U.S. Mint to use the D mint mark, or the story of the many other mints that the U.S. Treasury Department has historically operated in the United States, each of which is intimately entwined with the history of the city in which they were built and the American frontier. The story of America's forgotten mints deserves to be remembered. Congress passed the Coinage Act on April 2, 1792, establishing the first national mint. Under the Articles of Confederation, the states themselves were authorized to mint their own currency, but following the ratification of the Constitution, it became imperative for the country to create a national coinage. This effort was spearheaded in part by Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. As he wrote in his 1791 report to Congress, a nation ought not to suffer the value of the property of its citizens to fluctuate with the fluctuations of a foreign mint. The act also required that each coin feature an impression emblematic of liberty and several denominations not in common use today, the quarter eagle worth $2.50, the half eagle worth $5, and the eagle worth $10. Congress chose Philadelphia, then the U.S. Capitol, as the location of the first mint, and President Washington chose David Rittenhouse, a renowned American scientist, to direct it. The mint was the first federal building erected under the Constitution, and the building was eventually emblazoned with the words, Ye Old Mint. The mint delivered its first coins in March of 1793, 11,178 copper cents. Today, two major mints in Denver and Philadelphia produce all the coins needed for the United States, but in the early days, large frontiers and poor roads were a problem minting all the coins in just one place, and especially out on the frontier where miners and mineral seekers needed a convenient way to turn their gold and silver into coins and bills and bars. In 1799, a 12-year-old boy named Conrad Reed pulled a 17-pound yellow rock out of a stream near Charlotte, North Carolina. His family used it as a doorstop for three years until Reed's father, John, brought it to a jeweler and sold it for $3.50 in 1802, less than $90 in today's money. The jeweler would later make a thousand-fold profit on the rock, and John Reed, furious at being swindled, started placer mining on his farm. The North Carolina gold rush would underlie the need for another mint. Federal coinage was rare in the South, and the need for a saying or determining the purity and value of the gold was driving growing demand for the government to establish a mint in Charlotte. A German immigrant and jeweler named Christopher Backler created his own mint, and in 1831 began a saying and smelting quarter eagle and half eagle equivalent bars. He minted his first $1 coin in 1832, becoming the first gold $1 coin to be minted in the U.S., and between 1836 and 1838 would mint over $770,000 worth of gold coins. His business fell off when the government finally authorized several branch mints, including one in Charlotte, that opened in 1837 and used the mint mark C. The government, of course, had reason to be wary of private minting operations, and though they had declined several times, they were finally forced to bend to the public will. Almost simultaneously, a second gold rush was underway in the North Georgia mountains near the small town of Licklog. In fact, gold had been known in the area for centuries, with Native Americans and Spanish, such as explorer Hernando de Soto, both panning for and using the gold as early as the 16th century. The gold rush wasn't touched off until 1829, and numerous people claimed to have made the discovery. A man named Benjamin Parts claimed to make the first discovery October 27, 1828, but there are holes in his story. He originally claimed to have discovered it in 1827, but someone pointed out that the land ownership records didn't line up. Prospectors were already arriving in November of 1828, which seems unlikely if he'd only just discovered the gold a few days earlier. Another story says that John Witherroods was the first to find a three-ounce nugget in Duke's Creek, and yet another story claims that Jesse Hogan, a prospector from North Carolina, first found the first gold near Dahlonega. None of the claims have been definitively proven. Whoever discovered the gold, by 1829 a Georgia newspaper announced two gold mines had been discovered in this county. By 1830, mining operations had begun in earnest. Problematically, much of the land in northern Georgia belonged to the Cherokee, a fact that the miners and Georgia politicians were happy to ignore. The Cherokee called it the Great Intrusion, and the Cherokee Phoenix, a native newspaper, reported that men who regard no law and pay no respects to the laws of humanity are now reaping a plentiful harvest. We are an abused people. 
In 1832, Georgia decided that the fairest way to deal with the issues of land ownership was to seize the Cherokee land and raffle it off. Men paid $10 to enter and could win a lot of 40 acres. This also meant that any existing mines would change hands. It was in part due to the gold rush that in 1838 the Cherokee were forcibly removed to Oklahoma along the infamous Trail of Tears. That same year, a mint opened in Dahlonega, the town's name coming from a Cherokee word for yellow. This is the mint that originally used the D mint mark. Before the mint was built there, it could take as much as three months for gold to be assayed and a certificate to be sent by the Philadelphia Mint. Still, between 1830 and 1837, $1.7 million in Georgia gold deposits were sent to Philadelphia. Dahlonega would mint 1.5 million coins, worth more than $6 million by the time it closed in 1861. The government authorized these branch mints to meet the needs of the local miners who could not get their gold properly assayed with local independent assayers who were often the barkeepers and traders themselves. And the last of the mints that were authorized in 1835 was in New Orleans. While Dahlonega and Charlotte produce exclusively gold coins, the mint at New Orleans wasn't created to serve a gold rush. Instead, the New Orleans mint was meant to alleviate the problem of coin scarcity in the South and West. It was estimated that in 1830, only one small coin, a dime, half dime, or quarter, existed for every person in the country. The U.S. was not even minting silver dollars, which they had stopped in 1804 because the American coins were being traded for underweight Spanish coins in the Caribbean. This problem was exacerbated by President Jackson, who in 1836 required that land payments be made in gold or silver. New Orleans was chosen for its strategic location as a trading port. It conducted more foreign trade than any other city in the nation. It would become the most important branch mint in the country and would mint over $300 million in coinage. All three branch mints were seized by the Confederate States of America shortly after their respective states seceded. All three minted coins under the Confederacy, mostly with the same staff. 887 half eagles were minted in Charlotte in the nine days they kept it open. Claire Birdsell, a mint historian, estimated that the mint at Dahlonega produced around 1,600 half eagles and 3,000 gold dollars after secession. The New Orleans mint lasted the longest, minting just under a million silver half dollar coins until April of 1861. The Confederates also seized the nearly half million dollars in coins that were already stored there. Only the mint at New Orleans would open again, and then not until 1879. It closed for good in 1909. On January 24, 1848, James W. Marshall reported finding gold at a mill he was building in Coloma, California, in what was then Mexico, but would soon be part of the United States. News of his find sparked the largest American gold rush in history. In 1852, the government decided to open the mint's fourth branch in San Francisco. In 1854, the mint officially opened and its first year produced over $4 million in gold coins. The mint would outgrow the original facility to be replaced by the Granite Lady, an enormous building built to withstand earthquakes. It was one of only a few buildings that survived the Great Earthquake in 1906. It moved to a third location in 1937. The mint was closed in 1955, though it took over proof coinage from Philadelphia in 1965 and regained its status as a branch mint in 1988. While the Civil War raged, Americans in the West were still living on hard times on the frontier and prospectors were still looking for their big break. In 1848, a group of Cherokee following the Cherokee Trail to California found some gold in a creek in what would become eastern Colorado. The charismatic William Green Russell had grown up near Dahlonega during the gold rush and then participated in the California gold rush. He married a member of the Cherokee tribe and in 1858 led a party into the Colorado wilderness. This would eventually spark the Pikes Peak Gold Rush. Like earlier gold rushes, locals minted coins in the absence of the government, most prominently the firm of Clark, Gruber & Company. The government eventually bought the company out and opened an assay office in 1862. Though significant amounts of gold were brought to the office, the government didn't open a mint in Denver until 1906, giving it the mint mark D since Dahlonega had been closed for over 40 years. It is the only U.S. mint mark to be used by two separate mints. In 1864, a branch mint was also authorized at Dallas City, Oregon due to gold rushes in the region. But a series of delays, including the death of the first director on his way to the mint, meant construction did not even begin until 1869. The waning gold rushes and the creation of the San Francisco Mint essentially made the mint obsolete and construction was abandoned in 1870. In 1859, news got out that gold had been found on the eastern slope of Mount Davidson in present-day Nevada. The real story wasn't about the gold, though, as the men there had found what would turn out to be the first major discovery of silver ore in the United States. 
Whoever made the discovery is up for some debate. The find is known as the Comstock Lode, after miner Henry Comstock, but it is clear that he did not discover it. In 1850, a young Pennsylvanian named Abner Blackburn was leading a party of Mormon gold seekers to California. As they waited for the snow in the mountains to melt, he went out to the ravines to prospect and found gold in small quantities in three places. It wasn't enough to stop them heading to California, but Blackburn left a name for the place in his journal, Gold Canyon. By 1857, there were others panning for gold in the area, but only a pair of brothers named Allen and Hosea Grosh realized that the thick blue clay that was clogging the miners' machines was not worthless, but was in fact silver. They tried to raise money to mine the silver veins that they'd identified, but life on the frontier claimed them both. Hosea injured himself with a pickaxe and died of the infection. Allen stayed long enough to borrow money for a good suit to bury his brother in, and then to pay off the debt for the suit. And by the time he and a partner started the trek over the mountains to find investors, it was autumn, and a troublesome donkey slowed them down until they were caught in a storm. They died without ever reaching California. In 1859, Peter O'Reilly and Patrick McLaughlin made claims in the area. Comstock showed up shortly after they made their claim and insisted that they had either jumped his claim or that he had already owned the land as a ranch, according to later stories. He was able to coerce the two into letting him and one of his friends join them as partners in the claim. A local rancher named B.A. Harrison, about 10 miles from Comstock's mind, took some of the ore to be assayed in the town of Grass Valley by a judge named James Walsh. Walsh found that there was gold in the ground there, but more importantly, he identified the blue clay as silver. Harrison, Walsh, and some other associates hurried to buy or make claims on the load. Comstock would eventually sell his claim in the mine to Walsh for $11,000. The rush itself didn't really start until Walsh sent 40 tons of silver and gold ore to San Francisco. By 1863, the value of the Comstock load, so named supposedly because Comstock was a braggart and made himself visible, was so great that the U.S. authorized a branch mint in nearby Carson City. Though its cornerstone wasn't laid until 1866, no coins were minted until 1870. The mint ran from 1870 to 1885, was closed for a time for political reasons until 1889, and then closed again for good in 1893. It minted over $49 million worth of gold and silver coins, especially, and perhaps most famously, the Morgan Silver Dollar, with the CC mint mark. The history of these short-lived, often forgotten U.S. branch mints is part of the history of the American frontier and the story of the thousands of men and women who went out to seek fortune and freedom in these isolated lands that held so much promise. And the existence of branch mints was a, a trusted edifice of federal power in these far-flung places. You know, before the ubiquity of U.S. coins, coins in the United States were minted by whoever had a smelter and a press, and replacing them with U.S. minted coins was a significant important symbol of the power and presence of the U.S. federal government on the frontier. The original mint in Philadelphia was torn down in the early 1900s as the owner couldn't convince the city that it was worth it to upkeep the old buildings. The mint buildings in Charlotte, Carson City, New Orleans, and Dahlonega all still stand and are all currently being used as museums. The original mint in San Francisco burned to the ground, but the Granite Lady still stands and after much renovation is used as a public space and can be rented out for events. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.